How's everybody doing? Good? 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 All of those things are positive? Um, so I have a couple of kind of big picture administrative things I want to talk about. Um, and then I will move into the slides. So um, first of all, I want to um, just give you a little bit of information schedule-wise. This is the original version of the schedule. Um, you can see that we are um, one day behind because we are doing T-cell receptor today on October 16th. Um, and um, there may, I may be able to pick up a little time before exam one ex, or exam two. Exam two is not moving, staying where it is. Um, the original goal was that we had two days of paper discussions, so you had extra time to make sure you were processing all of this information. Um, right now it looks like we'll have only one day of paper discussion, but I'm still kind of working on things, and also, like I said, it'll depend on if I can pick up any additional time. Um, that said, you will notice that originally the T-cell development problem set was due this Friday. Um, but I'm just uncertain about making sure you have enough time to, again, think about T-cell development from when I teach it to when the problem set is due. So we're going to have that problem set due on Mon the following Monday, the 23rd, again. So again, just like we have a problem set due today by 5, which we'll get to in a second, um, the next problem set for T-cell development is going to be due next Monday at 5. Um, it is already posted um, on Moodle so that you'll be able to find it. But you will also notice that there's a PRR assignment on Friday, on the Friday the 27th. Um, that one is also already posted, and I'm not going to push that one back. I'm going to try to get us back on schedule of things. Um, so both of those assignments, you've got the one next Monday, the one next Friday, are posted. And I especially want to mention this PRR assignment because there is a, some reading that you have to do before you answer the questions. And it can be a little bit of a reading heavy assignment. So I want you to know now, other than like, because it's, it's helping to link some other things we've learned with T cell activation. We haven't quite gotten to the T cell activation stuff yet. Um, we're getting there. Um, but you certainly can do, can get most of that assignment actually now. It's just that you don't have the last pieces of T cell activation. So just so you know, um, if you look at Moodle, you will see that we've got the T cell development problem set. And then there's this PRR primary lit assignment. It's kind of this lengthy assignment that explains a bunch of background to the problem in the field and then has some questions. Um, it references a few different papers. You have to read two of them, but there are two others I made available in case you wanted to know more about them. So these top two are just kind of the background things. The bottom two are the ones that you actually have to read. Um, so that's the information for those upcoming assignments and it's all on Moodle, all ready to go. And as always, I'm happy to um, answer questions and talk about any of that. Um, today, we're going to talk about some details related to the T cell receptor. Um, I was looking at kind of the slides and the way I do this. Um, and most likely, I may be able to just start a little bit of discussion of T-cell development, which will be the main topic for Wednesday. Um, but I may give, be able to start to sort of start us a little bit into T-cell development today. Um, because usually the things I end up saying about the T-cell receptor don't take quite the entire time. Given that I know that this T-cell receptor stuff doesn't take the entire time, and based on some emails that I got this weekend, I want to talk about a couple of different problems that I hadn't previously had time to talk about related to MHC. And then we'll move into the T-cell receptor stuff. I'm doing these right now. And if you, for example, say, oh my gosh, now I want to make some tweaks to my answers to my problem set, you could do that. Remember, it's not due till five. <laughs> um, so we can start out with this um, scenario that came from an immunology textbook. And 
this scenario is a scenario where we are um, looking at um, an offspring and um, biological mother and three potential fathers. So it's basically a paternity test kind of question. Um, I once had made a similar question to this on an exam and I made it about Mamma Mia and the fact that there are like three possible fathers in that movie. So um, we can, here you're seeing which MHC class one, so HLA, A, B, and C, um, genes these uh, individuals have, and we can use the information that we see to determine which of these possible fathers is, in fact, the father. So how would we do this, or what kind of information would we get when we were looking at this? What, what can you, just from your looking at it, what might you come up with? Yeah, Emma. Okay. We see that in the offspring, like if we looked at the mother and the offspring, mm -hmm. they share A3, D59, and C8. Okay. So we're looking for a father who has A11, D78, or sorry, A43. A A yeah. <laughs> Right. And so we can do that. We can basically figure out, OK, I know which um, HLA is the, the offspring got from the mother, because I can see the mother and the child have A3 in common. So the mother must have given the baby A3 and I can like check that one off and I could go through and I can find out which one, which A, which B, which C we got from the mom. We then have the leftover ones. Those must have come from the dad. And then what do we do? What's the like last part of this? It's like so obvious that you don't even see that there's a part. Then we, we look to see which one of the dads have the leftover ones. So we know we're like, okay, we've got 43, we've got 54, we've got five, and we find, as Emma mentioned, a father who has those, who could have passed those on. And which one do we come up with? Number two. Okay. So this is one way of thinking about um, these MHC molecules and specifically thinking about these MHC genes. But one other thing that we know when we think about these MHC genes is that they tend to be inherited together. So we also know something else from this um, scenario. Um, we know that in the offspring, A3, B59, and C8 are on the same piece of DNA. Because that's the piece of DNA that came from mom, chromosome 6. And we know that A43... B54 and C5 are also on the same piece of DNA. And we would refer to these as the two haplotypes of this, this offspring. We can also use this information to tell us the mom's haplotypes. So we know mom has one of mom's chromosomes is A3, B59, C8, because she had to pass those three together to the child. She, we know that mom's other chromosome has to be A11, B78, and C8. And we can go through this and figure out what's on each chromosome for different people here. For the, the two fathers who aren't the father, um, we can't tell anything about them. But for the, when we have the parent and the child, we can actually get this kind of information. And so this leads us to some questions that look like this, where we might have a family, and we, I might specifically ask you to identify the MHC haplotypes of the mother and father. Um, and so specifically what I'm looking for there is basically for you to tell me 
which genes traveled together on the chromosomes of the mother and the father. So what's on one of mom's chromosomes, what's on the other one? Same thing for dad. So there should be four answers here, each of the two chromosomes for each parent. So if I look at the child, I can tell which chromosome the parent gave to the child, and I can use that to help me figure out which one of the, the parent's chromosomes, and then I use the leftovers <laughs> to tell me about the other one. So which MH, so if we think about this, we can do mother, and I really hope, I thought of this last night, like, man, I really hope that this example that I do in class isn't the exact same one that's on the problem set. And I don't remember if it is or not, but we'll go just see how it goes. Um, so which HLA types or which HLA genes did the mother give to the child? Yep, Grace. So the mom must have A2, B27, and DR3 together on one chromosome to pass them all to the child together. So there's one of mom's haplotypes. What's mom's other haplotype? Yeah, Joel. And how did you get that, Joel? Yeah, you just wrote down the, the, the leftover ones. The ones that aren't on the one piece of DNA must be on the other piece of DNA. All right, what um, MHC molecules did the father give to the child? That will That's going to give us one of the father's chromosomes. So which ones are, did the father give to the child? Yeah, Michaela. So we've got A20, B57, DR5. As one of dad's chromosomes. What's dad's other chromosome? Yep, Andrew. Uh, so we use our leftovers. We get dad's other chromosomes. And so I've got these four answers together are the four haplotypes. If you notice, whenever I ask a question that says, identify the MHC haplotypes of the mother and father, you will also notice the number of points is always divisible by four. Um, it's usually either two points or four points. <laughs> Um, so that's also a little bit of a hint. <laughs> um, so I got a bunch of emails about these kind of questions this, this weekend, so I thought it would be helpful if we just talked it over uh, in general. Our, ooh. Um, and so we are now um, ready to get back to thinking about T cells and T cell responses. Um, we have finished thinking about the antigen MHC plus peptide that turns on a T cell. Um, we talked a bit about uh, some details of T cells in the past, and now we're going to actually get back to the T cell side and start thinking about the T cell receptor. Um, one thing to be paying attention to today, but also in some days going forward, is that we're going to see a bunch of different proteins at different times and sometimes students can get a little confused about which protein is on the T cell versus which protein is on the infected cell or on the antigen presenting cell. And so as we talk about protein protein interactions, make sure that you're noting to yourself if which one's on the T cell, which one's on the antigen presenting cell. So here the T cell receptor is on the T cell. The MHC plus peptide is on the infected cell or the antigen presenting cell. Um, and we can think about the T cell receptor um, with a lot in a lot of similar ways that we thought about the B cell receptor. The T cell receptor is shown in the middle of this slide, and it has two different chains. They're about the same size, to be perfectly honest with you, although we're going to call one a heavy chain and one a light chain. 
they're really about the same size. Um, you can see that they are made of immunoglobulin domains. You can see that each one of our the chains has a transmembrane domain. You can see that they're held together by a disulfide bond. And you can see that we have this antigen binding site. Um, and it's kind of shown with these little points on the end. In fact, they end up being three little loops that are complementarity determining regions, exactly as you saw with the B cell. In a lot of ways, the T cell receptor structurally looks like an FAB arm of an antibody, just with a little transmembrane domain attached. Um, you can see this in terms of sort of a more 3D structure kind of model on the right. So you can see we've got the constant regions, um, and these are traditional immunoglobulin domains. And in fact, yes, we have a variable region and a constant region on both of our chains, just like we had on the antibody. Um, you know, we've got the variable region with the antigen binding site, the constant region closer to the membrane. We've got those constant regions here. We've got the variable regions here. We've got three little loops on both chains, the heavy and light chain, that are going to be the complementarity determining regions. Those are the things that are actually touching the MHC plus peptide. So we can see a lot of similarities to what we've seen with the B cell receptor in looking at the T cell receptor. I've also already told you that the T cell receptor has rather low affinity for MHC plus peptide. So the binding strength for T cell receptors binding to MHC plus peptide is kind of weak. As a result, if we want to have the T cell bind to that um, antigen presenting cell or that infected cell well, we need some other proteins to help make the binding stronger. We need to kind of get by with a little help from our friends. Um, and we are going to see some today, some later on, a bunch of different proteins that are involved in this interaction. Some of them, like the ones that are shown here in yellow orange are kind of like to the side <laughs> they help the signals that are going to happen a lot but they aren't actually like doing the initial work of the t-cell receptor they're like bonus <laughs> usually we call these proteins that are sort of the bonus ones co-stimulators or co-stimulatory signals and we call the proteins that are actually really important for letting the T-cell receptor do its first actual signal job, um, the co-receptors, because the T-cell receptor would not even work without them. And so at different times, I am going to mention things that are uh, related to the uh, co-receptor versus things that are related to co-stimulators um, though the co-stimulators are going to come up much more in later lectures. Um, so here is our T-cell receptor. Ta-da! We've got the variable region, constant regions, we've got the heavy chain, the light chain, all sorts of things you've seen before. If you remember, when we talked about the B-cell receptor, we discussed sort of important aspects of a receptor things that were key about the receptor. And we did a compare and contrast with some other cell biological receptors, and we realized some things that kind of sucked about the B-cell receptor. If you look at the T-cell receptor and think about the same types of criteria, what might you notice about the T-cell receptor? Yep, Emma. Okay, so we have a uh, fewer, we don't have the two in different arms with the antigen binding sites, so we've only got the one. It's part of the reason for the weaker uh, binding strength, absolutely. What else can you notice here? So remember, that's kind of about the receptoriness of it. Mm 
what else did we talk about or what else should we be looking at or looking for here? Yep, Joel. Well, so there's a transmembrane domain, but there's basically no cytoplasmic domain. So you look and you can see that the receptor pretty much ends as soon as it makes it through the membrane. Why is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember we talked about, you sort of have to think about what's the receptor -y part, what's the tyrosine -y part, and what's the kinase part, right? And because we need to actually do some signaling from this receptor. And there's no cytoplasmic region of this receptor to do signaling. There's no tyrosine to get phosphorylated. There's no kinase to do any phosphorylating. This receptor just stops. I mentioned on the previous slide that the T cell receptor needs help from its friends. And this is yet another reason why we need additional proteins to help out the T cell receptor. With the T cell receptor, one of the major things that we have it are some additional protein chains known as CD3. And CD3 is also known as part of the, is part of the co-receptor um, for the T cell receptor. Um, CD3 is actually made of a few different sort of protein chains put together. So there is a CD3 delta. There is a CD3 gamma. There are two copies of CD3 epsilon. And there are two copies of CD3 zeta. And so you can see there's this delta epsilon pair, there's this gamma epsilon pair, and there's this zeta zeta pair. You can see them in this image on the left. You can also see them in this image on the right, where we've got these six additional CD3 chains. Um, one of the things, and again, this was um, one of my classmates, or he was a couple years ahead of me in grad school who actually showed this, so I always find this really cool, is that CD3 actually does diffuse in the membrane with the T cell receptor. So even though these are different proteins and they're not covalently linked, they still can diffuse around the membrane together. Um, because they have different charges um, in their transmembrane domain that make them all attract to each other. And so there are different charges and the charges actually even sit at different levels in the membrane and keep them all attracted. And that's based on which amino acids are in which locations. So while these are separate proteins, like the T cell receptor doesn't actually work or do anything without CD3. This is also why, um, also CD3 is basically the same among everybody. So we don't see the variation and every T cell has the same CD3. So like every T cell has a different T cell receptor, but they all have the same CD3. This is one reason why we as immunologists, when we want to find T cells by flow cytometry, we just use an antibody against CD3 because CD3 is the thing that makes the T cell receptor work. So like it has a function that's only in T cells. The thing that is really important for us about CD3 is the cytoplasmic domains of CD3. Yeah, epsilon and gamma and delta do have a little bit of an extracellular domain. You don't care. The, the, biologically, like that is not that useful. The thing that's useful is the intracellular domain and particularly these areas that are shown as ye yellow rectangles. The yellow rectangles are a specific um, domain, a specific protein domain called an ITAM. You can see that delta and epsilon here each have one ITAM. Gamma, epsilon here each have one ITAM. And you can see that the zetas each have three. So the zetas have a lot. And these ITAMs are really what are important about CD3. You already saw ITAMs earlier this semester. 
when we talked about the B cell receptor and kind of similar issues with the B cell receptor. I told you about two proteins, Ig alpha and Ig beta, also known as CD79A and CD79B, that help with the B cell with that signaling. CD3 is doing the identical job. And in fact, um, Ig alpha and Ig beta also have ITAMs. ITAMs are basically a specific set of amino acids. And there are kind of two pieces that are going to be important here. So ITAM stands for immunotyrosine activation motif. Immuno because it's in immune system stuff. Motif because it's like a set of amino acids. But the things that are really important is tyrosine. So you can imagine each of these yellow boxes having a really important tyrosine in it. And that tyrosine is involved in helping activation happen with the receptor. So it's an immunotyrosine activation motif. So these basically are providing the cytoplasmic tails that can get phosphorylated. Later in the semester, we're going to see something called an ITIM an immunotyrosine-based inhibition motif. And you can imagine it's going to lead to off-signaling instead of on-signaling, but otherwise be basically the same. Um, so we've got a receptor here. We've got the place where we have these tyrosines in the ITAMs, but we still don't have a kinase. If you remember with the B cell receptor, I said, eh, there's a kinase, don't worry about it. Here I'm actually going to tell you a little bit more about the kinase. Um, part of the important way that we allow the T cell receptor with its weak binding strength to bind to MHC plus peptide um, and get some stability is we have this extra protein that helps with stabilization. In the case of MHC class 1, that extra protein is CD8. You can see CD8 is binding to this back sort of conserved part of MHC class 1, and that helps stabilize this interaction. You can see that CD4 similarly binds to MHC class 2, that back um, part of MHC class 2, in order to stabilize that interaction. Um, and so these are also part of the co-receptor. So we either talk about the CD4 co-receptor on a CD4 T cell or the CD8 co-receptor on a CD8 T cell. The reason why I bring this up here is that CD4 and CD8 each have a kinase that is really tightly associated with them. Um, you can see a kinase here called LCK that is associated with CD4. Technically, if we're talking about CD8, it's not LCK, but it's a similar related kinase in the same family. Um, so if you think, if you for the, your, these purposes think that it's LCK, that's okay. Even if technically it's one of LCK, it's like LCK's brother. It's all right. Um, and so what happens is typically our T cell has its T cell receptor and the um, CD3 molecules, and they're diffusing around the membrane, doing their thing, right? And CD8, if we're talking about a CD8 T cell, is in the membrane, diffusing around, doing its thing. So they're both just kind of going wherever. If MHC comes around with a peptide, T cell receptor is going to bind, and that's going to hold the T cell receptor in that place. And CD4, in this case, in the, or CD8 in my other example, whatever one it is, is going to also get bound. They're both going to get sort of caught on that same MHC plus peptide. And that's going to bring their outsides, their extracellular domains, together so that they can both bind to MHC plus peptide. But the result is also that the inside parts, the cytoplasmic parts of all these things are going to come together. 
So if you force the outside parts together, you force the inside parts together too. And this kinase, LCK, that is hanging out with CD3 or CD4 is suddenly going to be brought into proximity of those ITAMs, those tyrosines that are ready to go and be phosphorylated. And now when we bring this kinase in close proximity to those tyrosines, we can phosphorylate them, or in this figure, get little pink dots at it. Um, it's a little bit tricky because what you really, what I really wish about this figure is that CD4 and LCK were like really far away before, and you see them get brought closer. And here they are brought closer, but like barely closer. So imagine this was like super far away before, and then got brought closer, and that's what brought these into proximity. It wasn't that they were only that far apart before. Um, and so this is going to be a big part of how we turn on a T cell. So immunologists spent a bunch of time thinking about the T cell receptor, trying to understand the T cell receptor. They saw a lot of similarities, as we said, to um, the B cell receptor. You can see our complementarity determining regions, or our CDRs, up here. We can actually see where those CDRs map relative to the peptide and to the MHC. We can see sort of some interesting things about the angle of binding. We can see all this cool stuff. And we can do some math. And we can find out that in each person, there are about 10 to the 16th different T cell receptors. Each T cell has one unique receptor to bind to one unique thing, um, you know, so that we can get rid of foreign things, not deal with self things, all the stuff we saw with B cells. And so there was this period of time where immunologists saw all of this information and they had a hypothesis and they sort of had some ideas about some things. Um, because remember, when we talked about B cells, I told you that number of about 10 to the 16th B cell receptors and told you how it was so much more than the number of genes and said, and we had to have this whole process that was complicated, took us a while to learn, to figure out how that business worked, right? So now imagine you're an immunologist. You come to this point of seeing all, of, making all these observations about the T cell receptor. You might get scared. And in fact, they were scared for a little while. What are you kind of thinking about at that point? Wondering about, scared about, hoping. What, what are the thoughts when you hear that same 10 to the 16th problem when I tell you about T cells that we had with B cells? Yeah, Kyra. Um, so they're actually, so we actually don't worry a ton about the cell numbers. Absolutely. See, you guys are just, you guys are kind of assuming, because I think I've actually already hinted at this, that these earlier immunologists didn't know. I think, I think you guys are thinking past where I'm going. I mean, I just looked at this and they were like, oh crap. Do we have to learn another really hard mechanism? of how we get all this diversity. You mean we gotta go through and learn a whole other thing again? It was hard enough to find that first one. How do we, what do you mean we gotta learn this other one? And they had one thing that they really hoped for. What do you think they really hoped for? Yeah. Man, if, Boy, I really hope that we get VDJ recombination again, and it's exactly the same, and I don't have to learn a whole second thing. Boy, I hope it looks really similar. It's basically what those immunologists were saying. You know, I hope it, I hope it looks as similar to what we did in B cells as possible, so we don't have to invent a, and learn a whole other thing.
And lucky for them, they found that the T cell receptor is formed by VDJ recombination. Um, they are separate V's, D's, and J's. So now these are the T cell V's, D's, and J's instead of the immunoglobulin V's, D's, and J's. So if you remember on exams and things, sometimes I would write like IGHV. That means IG heavy V chain. And now I might write like TCRV because it's the T cell receptor V instead of the immunoglobulin. But there are a lot of ways where this is really, really similar. I mentioned to you that we tend to talk about um, the two different chains of the T cell receptor as a heavy chain and a light chain, even though they're about the same size. Well, the reason for that is the one that we call a heavy chain has a V, D, and J, and the one that we call a light chain just has a V and J, just like the ones in B cells. Um, if you had to guess, we're going to get into this more later, but if you had to guess right now of the heavy chain and the light chain, which one do you think rearranges first? Yeah. Heavy chain, just like B cells. Light chain rearranges second, just like B cells. Guess what? We're going to do D to J and then V to DJ. Just like B cells, like so many places where it's going to be just like B cells. So in a lot of ways, your life feels easy. Um, one other thing that is just like what we saw with B cells has to do with the um, complementary determining regions. So again, CDRs 1 and 2 are based on which V region is chosen either the V heavy or the V light. And the CDR3 is made by the junction of the V, D, and J. So if I were, you know, going to ask, I could ask you about, like, I could theoretically do, like, P nucleotides and N nucleotides, and we could draw, like, you drew for the other, all of that stuff, the same in um, T cells. In fact, when I was a TA, we used to be really mean and we would put another VDJ question, like identical to what you saw in exam one on exam two, but just call it T cells. Because it's the exact same, same thing. There's plenty of stuff for me to put on exam two. I usually don't need to do that, but we used to kind of do stuff like that. Um, but what you will also notice is I've been kind of using the names um, heavy chain and light chain here. And I need to give you some actual or some other names for them. So oftentimes, and again, we're going to come back to this and it's going to be annoying, but we're going to, we're going to do the simple way now. And then in a few slides, we'll do the complicated way. We talk about the heavy chain as being called beta, the TCR beta chain, and the light chain being alpha, the TCR alpha chain. And so you can see beta is our heavy chain. Alpha is our light chain. And again, you can see here the simplified alpha and beta loci. So you can see here is our beta chain. We've got some V's, D's, and J's. We've got our alpha chain. We've got some V's and J's. We've got a beta constant region or an alpha constant region. Again, looks all very, very similar to things that you have seen before. There are a couple places where there are little differences than B cells. So there are a couple places where things look different and things are special in the case of T cells. And so we need to think about those as well. And what I hope you notice is, particularly on the next slide, is, well, really on all of it, some of the reasons why I harp on some things in B cells is because now we're going to see like a compare and contrast where things are going to look different. And so I want you to be able to look at these slides and be like, wait a minute, that's not right, because it's different than what you saw before. And so one of the places where we see things that look very different um, has to do with the 1223 rule. Um, so in this figure, 
brown RSSs are 23 base pair RSSs, and yellow RSSs are the 12 base pair RSSs. At the top, you see a light chain. Remember, light chains have just Vs and Js and no Ds, so that's why that one's blank. And you can see that in uh, the light chain, we have one has a 23, one has a 12. They join together. We all live happily ever after. And then here with beta, we've got our heavy chain, and you can see our RSSs on the V, D, and J. So what do you notice is different in the T cell heavy chain compared to what you saw in B cells? Yeah, Emma. Yeah, so in B cells heavy chain, the V and the J had the same kind. Here we've got different kinds on the V and the J. And that's also related to one other pl place where we see things being different. So what's the other different thing that we see here with our TCR heavy chain? So the, the D has different RSSs on either side. It doesn't have the same one on both sides. So remember with B cells with your heavy chain, it was the same one on both sides for D. For T cells, they're different on either side. This leads to two important pieces or two important things that we could imagine happening in T cells that could not happen in B cells because of this RSS arrangement. We're going to first just say what they are, and then I'll tell you if they really happen or not. So just because we're saying them right now doesn't mean they really happen. So what could happen here with this heavy chain rearrangement that could not happen in the case of B cells? Yeah, Grace. It can rearrange V and J first. Okay. So it could put a V with a J and skip D. Since D is in the middle, it would actually delete D and just get rid of D entirely. So it wouldn't couldn't like do it later. We could put V with J and just skip D with this arrangement. So that's one of the things that could happen. What else could happen? I draw it out a different way, you'll see it. So there's what so one thing that could happen is the V joins to the J and skips the D. But there's another thing that could happen too. Yeah, Olivia. You could put a D with a D. You can see how you can get a D match up with another D because of the RSSs, right? It's called a DD fusion. Um, we do not see V's go with J's skipping D's. That does not actually happen. We don't totally know why, though we kind of have an idea why, but officially we don't totally know why. We do see DD fusions. What might be the benefit of a DD fusion? Yeah, Olivia. More diversity. It's even more ways you can get diverse outcomes. 
if you some if the sum of the cells use two Ds. So it's this additional diversification mechanism that we do see in T cells. Um, but in total, we still have combinatorial diversity of Vs, Ds, and Js. We still have junctional diversity. We still get a ton of total diversity through all the same mechanisms for our T cells. Um, and if we think about T cell receptors and compare and contrast with B cells, oh my gosh, we're using VDs and Js both times. We have heavy chains and light chains both times. We, we require RAG1 and RAG2 both times. In fact, I'm not going to go through the steps, but it's RAG1 and RAG2, and then there's a hairpin, and then there's Artemis, and then there's TDT. It's the exact same steps, like identical same steps. We have P and N nucleotide addition. Yes, sometimes in the case of T cells, we can get multiple D regions, and that was not a choice in B cells. So no for B cells can happen in T cells. Um, B cells are totally perfect at allelic exclusion. Sometimes T cells mess it up a little bit, but that's Wednesday's problem, not today's problem. Um, B cells can secrete the receptor as an antibody. T cells cannot secrete the receptor. They just use it as a receptor. Um, B cells, the constant region, like, does something and is part of the function, and we can switch it. That's yes. T cells, now we don't really care about the constant region, totally. You'll, then I'm going to like say something different on like a, a slide. B cells, we can get more mutations later in life of the B cell. T cells, we cannot. So you can see, you can sort of compare and contrast, but a lot of things you've already seen about making a B cell receptor can uh, apply to making T cell receptors. But T cells are annoying. And just, I've already told you the fact that we can think about T cells as having different types. They're not a homogenous mixture or a homogenous set of cells. Um, and I will admit, B cells aren't homogenous either, but I mostly talk about them as homogenous. I apologize to my sister who's listening to this, who is a B cell immunologist who cares about the different kinds of B cells. Um, T cells have a lot of different kinds. We've already seen that a little bit in this idea of having CD8 T cells versus CD4 T cells. So there's one place where we see different kinds of T cells. But it turns out that there are also T cells that can be different from one another based on their types of T cell receptors. So there are two different kinds of T cell receptors that can exist. One kind is called an alpha beta T cell receptor. And an alpha beta T cell receptor has an alpha chain and a beta chain. I know it's shocking how creative we are with this. Um, alpha beta T cells, which are sort of what I was telling you about before with the alpha chain and the beta chain, those are pretty much the standard normal T cells. Like if you've ever thought about T cells before in your life, you were thinking about alpha betas. Alpha betas are basically the classical ones. But there are some other T cells that have a different type of T cell receptor. They don't use the alpha and the beta chain. Instead, they use two other chains known as gamma and delta. Um, and these T cells are called gamma delta T cells. And gamma delta T cells have slightly different functions than do alpha beta T cells. And so the other place where we need to think about sort of unique aspects of the T cell receptor and VDJ recombination in the T cell receptor is how this alpha beta versus gamma delta thing happens. And so that's the other thing that's unique about T cells is that we have to somehow account for this gamma delta business. Um, so these are the uh, images showing the uh, Vs, Ds, and Js for alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. I told you previously 
that beta was heavy chain and alpha was light chain. What about gamma and delta? Which one's heavy chain? Which one's light chain? Yeah, Kyra. Delta's a heavy chain. And how do you know that? Yeah, so delta has B's, D's, and J's. So we know that that one's a heavy chain. And in fact, delta is the heavy chain in this case. And gamma is the light chain. We're going to see T cell development and kind of the steps of all of this rearrangement on Wednesday. But if you had to guess, which one rearranges first, delta or gamma? You think? Delta, because it's the heavy chain. And heavy chains go before light chains. So see, you can already kind of sort of see what's going to happen with a lot of these situations. But here is the problem. And I absolutely, I both love and hate this table because this table shows the exact thing I want to show, but it also shows something else and students like get hung up on the other one sometimes. So I want you to tell me something that is true in both human and mouse when we think about the T cell receptor genes. So this is showing you which chromosome the TCR alpha segments are on, which chromosome the TCR betas are on, which one the, the gammas are on, and which one the deltas are on. And the thing that's interesting here is true in all organisms. It's not just humans or mouse. So what's interesting about these TCR genes that is true in both humans and in mice? Yeah, Andrew. So say that again. So it, the, it, this isn't telling us the number of segments. It's telling us which chromosome they're on. So what would so it's, rephrase that? Yeah, alpha and delta are on the same chromosome. And yes, it always happens to be 14. The fact that it's 14, no one cares. Does alpha and delta are on the same chromosome? The same piece of DNA has alpha and delta in basically all the organisms. And it's not just that. These are actually the sort of maps of those gene segments. Here at the bottom, you can see gamma. You can see some V gammas, um, J gamma, C gamma to make that a gamma heavy chain. Here you can see beta. You can see, or sorry, this is just V's and J's. Here you can see V's, D's, and J's of beta. But then look up here at chromosome 14. What do you notice with chromosome 14? First, we've got V alphas, right? Then what comes after V alpha? V delta. And then what? Then we got, what is this? D delta. J delta. C delta. J alpha, C alpha. Delta isn't just on the same chromosome as alpha. Delta is actually in the middle of alpha. And so you can see the all the delta segments are in between the V's and the J's of alpha. So like delta is in the middle of alpha. So then let's imagine this cell makes an alpha chain. Let's imagine this cell makes an alpha light chain. It takes a V alpha and rearranges it with a J, puts it with a J alpha. What is going to happen when this cell makes an alpha chain? Yeah. 
is going to cut out all of delta. It's going to actually have to delete delta in order to make alpha. And you can see this here as well. Here's, here's all the delta stuff just shown as a brown box. <laughs> here's V alpha, J alpha. In order to make an alpha chain, you have to throw away, throw away the delta DNA. And you can see it in another uh, image here as well, where basically, so the cell really is going to have to decide, am I going to be alpha beta or gamma delta? Because it's not possible to make all four chains. If you make alpha, you throw delta away. There is no way that you can be both alpha beta and gamma delta. You got to choose. And so when we think about this whole process happening in cells, in T cell development, that choice point is going to be one of the points that we're going to have to think about, is when does the cell decide I'm going alpha beta or I'm going gamma delta. Um, I'm not going to say a ton about gamma delta T cells throughout the semester, but I, since they come up here, I will mention a couple things about them right now. Um, if we look at T cells before birth, the vast majority of them um, do seem to actually be gamma deltas. So it seems like you make gamma deltas early in life. Um, and we tend to see a lot of gamma deltas in many of our barrier organs. So in places like the skin or the GI tract or the lung, we see a lot of gamma delta T cells. In some ways, these cells um, tend to have some more innate-like properties, and they can be in some ways thought of as a good part of our barrier is that we have these gamma delta T cells there ready to go. And so they do have a lot of things that are really unique. We'll talk about them a little bit more later, but most of the time we're going to be talking about alpha beta T cells. Frankly, gamma deltas come up the most frequently in an intro immunology class when we learn about how we delete delta. Um, so just be aware that um, this is the deal with gamma delta T cells. Um, so if you remember when we thought about B cells, we talked a little bit about the B cell receptor. We talked about B cell VDJ recombination in, in sort of just thinking about the genes like pieces of DNA that I drew on the board. And then we took that same process of those genes doing their recombination, and we put it into some cells. And we did B cell development and made our B cells. We're going to now take all of this same information that we've been talking about and put it into cells um, and um, think about T cell development. And so I want to give you a little bit of an intro into T cell development in the seven minutes I have. Um, before we then get more into the nitty gritty of it on, um, on Wednesday. Um, so when we did B cell development, if you recall, B cell development all took place in the bone marrow. One of the key things that I want to tell you about for T cells is that the processes of T cell development do not happen in the bone marrow. Instead, they happen in the thymus. Um, so we're going to have some precursor cell that is in the bone marrow that's going to leave the bone marrow and go to the thymus. And so um, the thymus is a key thing for us to think about um, in this um, discussion. You can see, first of all, this does show nicely the difference between the thymus and the thyroid. Some students like to confuse those. Um, the thyroid's up here. The thymus is actually sitting directly on top of the heart. It's kind of two lobes that, sit, that look kind of like this. And it really can sit uh, very much over the heart. If we had a lab section here, we would have uh, dissected a mouse and you would have seen a mouse's thymus. Um, and you would have seen how it is sitting right on top of the heart. Um, I will mention that a little bit more with a couple of another slide that comes up later. Um, and so, as you can see, um, you know, we have those original stem cells, and eventually that cell is going to 
decide, hey, I want to be a lymphocyte, it might stay in the bone marrow and do B cell stuff. Or it might go to the thymus and become a T cell. And so it, um, note that basically for everything we talk about with T cell development, we're going to be like getting, just going to the thymus and starting in the thymus. Um, sometimes immunologists really talk about T cells, like they have to go to college, like they need their extra place to go learn, to go do development. Um, there is a really great book about for like non-scientists, I mean, to explain the immune system. It's really funny. It's called Immune. It's from this podcast called Kyrgyzstat. There are a lot of things I like about Kyrgyzstat, but they have this one episode I really don't like. So otherwise, I, I like I'm now like, Ugh. but anyway, I like Kyrgyzstat. Kyrgyzstat tries to explain uh, the thymus and they also use the, the, the T cells go to college metaphor. But if you remember with B cells, a lot of B cells that developed died. Do you remember we, we sort of saw that idea? With T cells, it's going to be even more. Like so many cells are going to die in T cell development. That in fact, Kyrgyzstat calls the thymus murder university. Um, so that helps you kind of think about some of the details that are going on. Um, and we're going to have to think a little bit about details of the structure of the thymus. Um, so we are going to spend time thinking about um, and mentioning some different areas of the thymus when we think about T cell development. If you look at the thymus under a microscope, you can pretty easily sort of divide into two different areas based on kind of this color of this staining. Um, one of these areas is the cortex. The other one is the medulla. And so at different times, I'm going to mention events happening in the, either the cortex or the medulla. Um, I like, um, and you can see that there are, um, you know, a few other um, areas that are labeled here. But I actually really like this image at the bottom. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about T cells in the thymus. Um, in the lab I worked in as an undergrad. And for some reason, I always imagine it looking kind of like the target symbol. But what I want you to notice is that like there's medulla and cortex like mixed all over the place. It's not like there's one row, like one ring <laughs> and then another ring. They're a little bit more mixed together. Um, so this is something that's going to come up uh, later as well. Um, but I'm going to highlight it a little bit now. If you look at this, you can see the medulla and the cortex, the difference between them pretty easily. And if you were going to explain this to a two-year-old, what would you explain is the difference between the cortex and the medulla from this picture? Yeah, Alexis. So I have my answer, but then I was like two years old. Like okay. One of them's lighter, one of them's dark, and one of them's light, right? That might be what you would say to your two-year-old friend, right? Okay. That's actually really important. And we're going to see in a few other places different parts of the, um, different parts of certain organs being dark and light. So now we're going to think about why would part of an organ be dark versus light? It's also actually drawn here, and you can kind of see it in this image as well. Why is one area, what's the big difference that you might see between these two areas here? Yeah. Yeah, this one's kind of full of those blue cells and this one's not as full. Some areas are going to be really, really, really full and densely packed of cells. And those areas are going to be kind of dark. It's kind of hard for light to get through them and we're going to, hard to get stain out of them and those are going to be dark areas, right? Usually when we see one of these organs and we see an area that's super dark, it's because it's so densely packed with cells. And other areas might be light and they are less densely packed with cells. And some of the actual events that are happening tie in with that darkness or lightness. We are also going to, you should also notice here that we've got a lot of, in our cartoon image, we've got a lot of these blue cells. And those blue cells are cells of the thymus. Those are the, or sorry, those are the developing T cells. Those are the T cells in this process. 
But what you can also notice is that we've got a whole bunch of other cells that are actually the cells of the thymus, the physical structure of the organ. Sometimes we're going to talk about the thymus cells, like the epithelial cells, the structure cells of the thymus. Oftentimes immunologists like to call those the stroma, the structure cells, and the developing T cells. And sometimes you also need to think about is what's important here the thymus structure cell or what is what's important here the T cell, the developing T cell. Um, that's going to be particularly important. I'm just going to mention this now. It's going to come up over and over again. Sometimes we do transplantations and we do fun tricks here. If I do radiation on an organism, if I do radiation on a mouse, I kill all the leukocytes. I kill all the lymphocytes in particular, which means I'd kill all the blue T cells. But I wouldn't kill the structure cells of the thymus. And so what I can try to do sometimes is I can take a mouse, I can wipe out its thymus, I can like get rid of all the developing T cells and put in whatever developing T cells I want. And I can see, like, does it matter if the gene is in the structure part of the thymus? Does it matter if the gene is in the T cell? Um, I can also do fun things where I do actually transplantations of thymuses. So I can mess with what thymus you have and I can mess with what T cells you have and try to mix and match. So realize that we're going to think a lot about do we care about that structure cell or do we care about the developing T cell? OK, um, and the rest of this stuff we will uh, pick up with on um Wednesday, uh, make sure that you get me your problem sets by five, um, and I will see you on Wednesday.